This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Renee Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, Laura Lotka. Today in studio, we have Billy Thomas. Billy is an extension forester in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. It's a pleasure to have you in studio today. Well, thank you all for having me. I'm glad to be here. So today we're going to talk about resources for woodland owners and on our website. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who may have missed our woodland owners episode of From the Woods, Kentucky, this time we're going to do a little walkthrough of the resources we have available. Right. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about your background for those who may have missed your Sure. So I'm an extension forester here in the mm -hmm. Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at UK and it's a job that I really enjoy and, and love a lot and what I try to do is help woodland owners understand the woodland resources that they have, mm -hmm. uh, how they can manage them and really who can help them. There's a lot of professional assistance available to them so I try to facilitate that, set up educational programs so supporting the woodland owners that really own most of the woodlands here in Kentucky. It's a very rewarding job and I feel fortunate to have. Oh so tell us a little bit about um, what first got you interested in forestry. Love of outside, love <laughs> yeah. of trees, you know, playing. We hear that answer yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah. Really, it was, you know. I, I had an opportunity to grow up in southeastern Kentucky and um, just beautiful landscapes down there and um, playing around in the woods and mm -hmm. along the Cumberland River and um, just really enjoyed the woods. And when it came time to kind of decide what I wanted to do when I grew up, you mm -hmm. know, looking for an opportunity to be around or work in woods um, like I was um, used to when I grew up um, was very appealing to me and found the Department of Forestry and, uh, you know, the rest is history. And it fit very well. It fit very well. It's worked out really well right. so far, I hope. All right, so you're going to go over some resources on what we have available on our website for woodland owners. Let's kind of dive into that a little bit. Sure. We've been working for a long time, and Renee, as you know, you're a big part of our <laughs> website here, but we have been working to try to supply a, a lot of content for not only woodland owners, but really anybody with an interest in forestry or wildlife or natural resources. There's a lot of stuff on there. We have <laughs> a lot of stuff on there, and I would encourage your listeners, if they can, um, to visit ukforestry.org, mm -hmm. and that's a shortcut to get to our Forestry Extension website. That'll take you directly to that. And from there, you can certainly browse around and look at different resources that we have available. But I want to talk about a few that I think may be of interest to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, one that really we want to think about here in Central Kentucky is we have a lot of smaller parcels. You know, people may only own one or two or a few acres or less than 10. It's right. quite common in Central Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times those landowners are not really sure what they can do from a forestry or wildlife standpoint. They mm -hmm. want to do something. Many of them do. They want want to benefit, you know, the nature and the animals and the trees that right. can be there. But understanding what they can do and how and how they can approach it can be kind of a challenge for some of them. Mm -hmm. So we worked with the Kentucky Division of Forestry a number of years ago to put together a whole section on our website dedicated to small woodlands. And you can look on our website and get on there from ukforestry.org and scroll down and we'll have a little button down there that says small woodlands. And there you click on the little small woodlands button and it'll take you to a resource page that talks a little bit about what we're trying to do with this program mm -hmm. but it really the highlight of it is we have a series of 12 fact sheets on there these are really quick simple fact sheets to discuss a lot of things that landowners may be interested in doing on their property that work really well with smaller parcels so landowners uh, or homeowners for that matter mm -hmm. check out our small woodland section we've got a wide variety of things on there um, firewoods one of them there may be yeah. opportunities to collect a little firewood from your parcel we've had a pack podcast yeah. on that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, Non-timber forest products. Maybe you want to plant some trees. Maybe you're looking for wildlife to come to your property and what can you do? We have that. Are there hazard trees and pruning them and how you want to go about that? So these are the things that are really quite common to smaller parcels. They're also important obviously for larger parcels as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we put these together in kind of an easy to read, easy to easily accessible um, format for landowners, really those with smaller parcels. So those are all free 
and available to anybody. We encourage you to they check them out. Download them. They can download them or view them online if they want. They don't have to print them or right. anything, but they are available. And if you if you find something that you know piques your interest within that, mm-hmm. each one of these will re- redirect you to additional resources or give you additional information where you can kind of explore and expand your knowledge. So I think for anybody that really owns less than ten acres, this is really a great starting point to understand what you can do with your woodland property, mm-hmm. even if it is smaller. Right. But how you can make it as healthy and productive as possible. Yeah, and, I, and I think most people like that. I was just going to ask you what constitutes a small woodland. So less than 10 acres. Perfect. <laughs> well, and you know, and that's a little arbitrary to be right. honest. But a lot of reasons why we use that 10 acre as kind of a, a, a minimum, if you will, for mm-hmm. um, small to large woodlands is because many of the federal programs that are in place are designed to work with properties greater than 10 acres. Oh, okay. So that kind of that sets that sets bar, that bar. A, a mm-hmm. little bit. Yeah. Um, but it's really, it's arbitrary to be honest. Honest, yeah. you know, so. And you mentioned that there's, you know, a lot of fact sheets on this page. Tell the listeners what a fact sheet is. You know, what are they looking right. at reading and things sure, like that? Sure, sure. So fact sheets basically are trying to get to the meat of the subject really quick. Um, what's the issue? What's the problem, if you will? And what can we do about it? What do we know about it? The different avenues that you can do. And then giving you kind of that, that step-by-step directions of what you need to do. So it's usually singular topic and uh, it's really concise. So it's a quick read and it's really focused on helping you deal with that issue, whatever mm-hmm. it may be. And then also, like I said, pointing you to additional resources if you want more questions to get answered or if you you know want to explore more about that subject. So Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So what are some other topics under the Woodland Owner tab that we're looking at here? So we have a number of different tabs. And again, if you get on UKForestry.org, you can scroll down. And it works really well on a mobile device Mm -hmm. as well. Um, You can see these little pictures, and they've got little um, descriptions of what's on there. So you can click around on those as you want. But uh, another one I wanted to talk about is we have a Woodland Health Threats tab. And this is important not only for our smaller landowners, but Mm -hmm. larger landowners as well. Unfortunately, there's a number of threats facing our woodlands. And I know you've had some shows talking about some of those in the past. Um, But I wanted to kind of highlight this this space on our website because it's a great place for really anybody that's concerned about the health of our woodlands here in Kentucky, whether it's yours as an individual owner or if you just care about our environment, Mm -hmm. that we have a great little resource here called Woodland Health Threats. It's a little button or a tab that you can click on. And when you go to that, you'll you'll be able to see some of the most pressing um, threats that we have here in our woodlands. And we break it down to a variety of different ways. Some of of those are biological. Some of them are human. Um, you know, <laughs> right. unfortunately, humans can cause some issues, whether it be wildfires, you know, arson mm-hmm. or other things like that, or timber trespass and theft. Mm-hmm. While that doesn't happen a lot, um, if it happens to you, it's a really big deal. Exactly. So it is a threat to woodland. So we have information on, um, again, timber trespass and threats, um, storm damage. If there's some kind of storm that rolls through the area where we have ice storms seemingly more regularly, right. um, and they can really wreak a lot of havoc on our woodlands. And understanding what you can do. Um, how you can evaluate those woodlands after an event, who can help you mm-hmm. navigate dealing with that That's mess. probably something you wouldn't think of as a woodland health threat, as a storm, right. you know, but it is. It I mean, certainly It can cause is. a lot of damage yes. to And we've seen that, you know, the, the, the tornadoes we had a number of years ago right. um, that ripped through Morgan County really destroyed a lot of woodlands in that region. Um, ice storms ice have storms. done that a lot mm-hmm. as well. So um, so we got information to kind of help people navigate that process, and it is very traumatic. It right. really is. You know, if you used to look out and your property is just going to devastate it, it is a very traumatic event, but we wanted to let people know that there is information about that, how you can go about it, mm-hmm. how you can assess it, and kind of who can help you do stuff with that. Also on that tab, we have some information about invasive plants, and that's a real problem that we have, certainly here in central Kentucky. Um, a lot of plants have been brought in um, for horticultural reasons or for wildlife or whatever, and unfortunately, some of those um, escape, right. uh, and some of them have the tendency to be very successful. Um, bush honeysuckle is one that we deal with a lot here in central mm-hmm. Kentucky, and it's really caused a lot of problems for a lot of our landowners that are trying to manage their woods. So we have information not only on bush honeysuckle, but some of the other ones that we have to deal with here, not only in central Kentucky, really, but across the state. And sometimes they may be grasses. We have some invasive grasses that can cause a lot of problems with tree regeneration. We also have some um, uh, trees, like tree of heaven is another species that causes us some problems. So we have information about those, um, how to identify them, what problems they cause, and how you can kind of control that. So that, that 
that's another segment in our, our woodland health thread section. We also have one on insects. You know, um, insects are a, are a challenge, not only some of our native insects, but some of our invasive species. And again, one that comes to mind readily in central Kentucky is the emerald ash borer. Right. It has devastated our ash trees throughout mm-hmm. Kentucky, and it's still on the march. And um, so we have a lot of information on that. We've been able to document some of the economic impact that that's causing here in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. It's significant. It really is. Mm-hmm. Um, we estimate it's costing woodland owners over $90 million annually right wow, now here yeah. in Kentucky, just the loss of those loss trees, of those trees. That, uh, and their value. So, And not only that, it's a problem because now we have also invasive plants that are kind of occupying those spaces where the native ash trees were. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a double whammy that that's doing. Um, but there's a few others that we want to keep an eye on. There's an Asian longhorn beetle that's been found in Cincinnati area. And we're, you know, we're really a little nervous about that because it has a number of different hosts that it can work mm-hmm. on. So that's one we want to keep our eyes out for and there's a few others too that are on there that you can find out we also have one a section within that woodland health threats on diseases you know there's a number of diseases some are a native that occur naturally but some are also invasive you know one that's um, and exotic for that matter mm-hmm. and one that comes to mind readily is the with the american chestnut um, we had a, a fungus that was introduced and really wiped out the american chestnut and that was a disease that was widely spread mm-hmm. but there's been other examples you know dutch elm disease was spread through um, beetles as well as um, grafting of trees where we planted one Dutch elm after another down mm-hmm. the street and then after a while it became a um, real problem there. So there's a number of diseases. So we have information on some of the more prominent diseases that you have there. And then we also have a little tab on woodland um, threat alerts. So these would be like the most pressing or what's you know really right in our face right now. So I would encourage you know our listeners if they have any concerns about the health of not only their individual forest but Kentucky's for us, check out our Woodland Health Threats tab because it's a great place to kind of get up to speed and get you pointed in the right direction as far as what's coming and what we can do about it. Mm So there are other um, avenues that we take, too, as far as um, newsletters and and things like that. So explain that a little bit on how people can, you know, maybe learn more about it. Sure. One of the things we try to do at Extension is to develop resources that can be useful. Other than uh, fact sheets. Yes. (laughs) And and they can come in a wide variety of formats, Mm -hmm. right? And one that we have been using a lot the last few years, and it's really a great way to kind of communicate really quickly with people, are electronic newsletters. But on our website, we have a place where if you're interested in subscribing to some newsletters, we have one that deals with Kentucky Woodlands, so it deals with what's going on in Kentucky's Woodlands at at any time, Mm -hmm. and um, upcoming programs or things that are happening or opportunities related to our woodlands, so that's a periodic one that I manage personally, and I'm the editor of that one, but I have several colleagues that also put out newsletters for different subjects as well. Um, We have one that deals with certification of wood companies that um, work and certified wood as well. So that's an opportunity if you're interested in forest certification and wood certification, tech newsletter that's there as well. We also have one for youth Mm -hmm. and 4-H development. You know, certainly our youth are the future. Right, Um, exactly. So educating them about what's going on with our resources, our natural resources, and and what they can do about it. It's really important. And it's really good also for people that work with youth audiences. So that's Mm -hmm. one that we have out there as well. And and then we do other periodic ones as needed. One for the wood industry. Yeah, one industry that comes up. So so, you know, so it's targeted to specific segments. Mm-hmm. So just get on there and you can basically, once you subscribe, you'll have the option to pick which ones you get. Right. Or all. Yeah, you, or can you can check, you, you can hit all emails. Right. And then we try not to bombard people with that mm-hmm. because I know we all get a lot of email <laughs> and it's a lot. Mm-hmm. So these are basically bi-monthly mm-hmm. um, every other month or so for the most part. So it's not too frequently, right. um, but it's enough to kind of keep people in the loop about what's going on. So that's a, it's a free, easy way to stay connected and learn what's going on. But if you are a woodland owner, it would be good to subscribe to the Kentucky Woodlands one because all of our programs, pretty much, that are upcoming for woodland owners are in that. Certainly, that's so probably you'll the, know. That's more. the freshest, best place probably mm-hmm. to get and stay current on what's going on related to Kentucky's woodlands, mm-hmm. um, especially for our woodland owners. So I would right. encourage them to um, subscribe to that. Yeah. We talked a little bit about our publications. And um, can you kind of explain um, what other publications we have? Uh, right. So uh, we talked about some of those fact sheets earlier, right. right, for the small woodlands. But we also have a long history of 
producing mm-hmm. extension publications. Right. And extension publications are basically the opportunity to take this research knowledge that we've gained either here at Kentucky or other places about issues related to forestry and natural resources, and then we've developed them as mm-hmm. a collective into easily accessible documents. They're longer than fact sheets, most of them. You know, they may be 10 or 12 pages, right. or it just depends on what it is, what subject we're dealing with, and how deep we got to go. But if you'll click on our publication, and videos tab button if you get onto ukforestry.org you'll be able to see um, the wide variety of publications we have there's also kind of linked with that are some of the videos that we have available so not only do we have a lot of print resources that you can download and print if you want it or just view them online um, but we also have a number of videos that are available free to watch and some of those are um, really specific and really short like um, how to identify trees or some mm-hmm. of the characteristics we look for some of them are longer and they may be an hour or more that really delve into a subject um, whatever it may be um, to get more for people so mm-hmm. um, but our publications again you'll notice that there's a number of different categories within those um, we deal with general forestry issues with some of our invasive species informations on there as well non-timber forest products taxes really anything related to forest woods and the wood industry we have some publications that are there mm-hmm. we also develop a number Number of different white papers on hot topics that come up. Um, we've done that a number of times with Emerald Ash Borer, so that's a place that you can also find those. So just a wide variety of different publications that are segmented by your interest. So you can get on there, look at our publications and based on your interest, and you can quickly find, I would think, something that would address most of your questions. Mm-hmm. Um, if not, they can always contact us and we'll try to help them. Um, but check out our videos as well. Like I said, we've got those little short how-to videos. Mm-hmm. We've probably got about 20 25 or so videos on our website that are less than 10 minutes and that will mm-hmm. tell you how to do something in your woods right. you know whether it's how to treat an invasive plant or how to cut down a tree or or how to evaluate a stand or how to measure a tree mm-hmm. or really whatever you want to kind of learn about forests and wood management um, you can find Even how that. to ID a tree, <laughs> how to ID a tree, which can be a challenge right. when you're here in Kentucky with right. over a hundred native species right. so um, it's just another kind of outlet and resource of uh, information again not only for woodland owners but for anybody with an interest in in woodlands here in Kentucky. You've been listening to From the Woods Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. I'm an Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management within the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at University of Kentucky. I'm here to teach you a little bit about the animals that live in our forests, especially those here in Kentucky. For those of you who might just be joining us, each week we'll play a wildlife sound from our forest. Here's our sound for this week. Stay tuned. Towards the end of the show, we'll talk about this animal and why it is making that sound. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. So tell us a little bit about the Kentucky Woodlands magazine that's listed on this page. We are very proud of a magazine that we've Mm -hmm. been developing for the last really 12 or so years now. And um, we put this out a few times a year, typically. Um, It has gotten a little more challenging with grant funding to put it out uh, more frequently. But it's a full color magazine. It's about 25 pages on average. And you can download all of them. Every issue we've ever developed, you know, I think there's 25 or more issues on there. There's a lot, yeah. (laughs) Um, that you can do, you can download you can download the individual articles on those and the great thing about the magazine not only is it very attractive as far as it's got a lot of graphics in it a lot of pictures um, shout out to Renee who does the layout <laughs> for that um, and it does look amazing which is really important because it, it draws people in and it's really appealing to look at but it's also chock full of good content it really is and we've been over the years developing content specifically on what's going on at any given time in forestry and wildlife management but the nice thing about many or really almost all of 
those articles in there is that they're they're timeless to a certain degree. They really are. Just because it's a few years older doesn't mean the content's not relevant and useful to an owner. So I would encourage um, landowners and anybody really that wants to kind of learn more and check out this amazing resource, right. get on our website and just click on Kentucky Woodlands at Magazine and you'll find out a lot more about that. And um, tell us a little bit, I, I know, you know, here on this Forestry Extension page, um, the calendar. Tell us how people can find out what you all are doing and some of the most recent things that are coming up. For Certainly. Um, if you're looking online, uh, either on your phone, uh, a, a tablet, or on your computer, you'll quickly see we have a look around for our, ca our calendar button there. So just click on our calendar, and there you'll see our most recent upcoming events, mm -hmm. what we're going to have going on. It'll give you information about what they are. Typically, there will be a flyer. Or something that gives you more detail about that specific content locations and timing they're also depending on the program and there may be links for registration of that event um, some programs do require registration and a fee others are free it just really depends on the natures of those programs so I would encourage people to check out our calendar for the latest and greatest of what's um, up and coming mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I was wondering, so why is it important for woodland owners to even care about their woodlands? Why should they come to our website and, you know, why should they care? All right. Well, woodlands are, again, I'm biased, right? <laughs> I, I think they're really important. And I think many of our woodland owners also really value and think of their property as important as well. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges for our woodland owners is they've not been trained professionally or, you know, through college or other kind of formal education to really understand the woodlands. I mean, they're not they're not ignorant of the woodlands, obviously, but they've not been educated in forest ecology, forest management, wildlife management, hydrology, some of the things that are really important to understand when we're trying to get the most out of our woodlands. Mm -hmm. So if, if landowners want to get really the most out of their woodlands and be happy with their ownership experience, in my opinion, you're going to probably have to do some type of management. You don't have to do a lot necessarily. It really is going to be based on what you're trying to accomplish with your property and what kind of situation your property in at the moment. So mm -hmm. is are you dealing with invasive plants right now or not? Right. You know, that might dictate what you would want to do. So as a woodland owner, you may not even know if it's an invasive plant or not. So uh, being able to identify some of these problems and threats before they expand and become much more challenging is really important for our woodland owners. Mm -hmm. Also, woodland owners may be um, not get a knock on the door that they somebody wants to buy their timber mm -hmm. and they may not have any idea about that process or what their timber's worth or anything. So understanding what you have and what you can get um, or who can help you manage that timber sale process is important so that's another example and again many of our woodland owners also really are interested in wildlife they like wildlife viewing and they want to have uh, maybe habitat for hunting opportunities for family or friends but there's techniques that we can do mm -hmm. that can help you achieve those goals much faster and cheaper than you know landowners just kind of struggling with it on their own mm -hmm. so it's it's a resource for people to get the most out of what they already their other resources resources that they have. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, you know, we appreciate you coming in today. Yeah. And for those of you that may have missed our earlier episode on Woodland Owners, I would encourage you to mm -hmm. go back and, and listen to that one, um, as well as, you know, go to our website and find out all the information with that. Um, is there anything like a takeaway item you'd well, like to leave our Well, I, I don't know if it's a takeaway item, but I do want to mention, you know, this has been kind of woodland owner specific, specific. Mm -hmm. but there are other segments on our website as well that deal with these other areas that are beyond woodland owners. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of tabs on our there that you can find information if you're in, if you're a forester, perhaps. Um, you want to find out about upcoming trainings or opportunities to get involved here in Kentucky. Um, we have a section on there for loggers. So if you're a Kentucky master logger, we have links for you to get there. It's also an opportunity for people to find master loggers in their county that they may be looking for to do some um, work in their woods. Um, we also have a section on there, uh, I mentioned earlier, certification for forest certification. And on our website, there's also a page of forestry links. These are common um, links of partners and others that are available beyond UK Forestry Extension to help folks. So I would encourage the listeners to spend a little time on the website. I think it'll be valuable time spent. I think we've got a lot of entertaining and really good sound content on mm -hmm. there that will help people get the most out of their woodland. So even if you're not a woodland owner, uh, but maybe somebody in your family is, send them to our website um, or have them give us a call and we'll try to help them get the most out of their woodland ownership experience. Of course, they can always hear all of our podcasts of this show yeah. as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you, Billy, for joining us today. We greatly appreciate you coming on and talking about Woodland Owner Resources. If you'd like more information on what you've heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned now for Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. Welcome back to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. I'm Dr. Matt Springer, Assistant Extension Wildlife Professor in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Before I tell you what that sound was you heard at the beginning of the show, let's play it again for you. Okay, so whatever that sound was, he doesn't sound happy. He is not happy, and that is a striped skunk oh, okay. who is potentially fighting off uh, a foe, another striped skunk, or mm -hmm. maybe a raccoon. Um, but he is definitely communicating, I am not happy and stay away. <laughs> okay. So why do they have that stripe down? Well, so um, they have, so we have, there's four different skunk species in North America. Oh, okay. Um, we have two different skunk species. We have uh, the striped skunk, which mm -hmm. is the most common one that we see pretty much in uh, neighborhoods and uh, farm fields uh, mm -hmm. and, and the woods. They're pretty uh, wide range of habitats. But we also have a smaller skunk species called the Eastern Spotted Skunk. Mm -hmm. And that is about the size of a know, eight week old kitten. Oh. They're very tiny. Very small. Yes, very That's tiny. That's full grown. That's full grown. Oh, okay. And then you know, add the tail on to it, right? right? It's a little puffy. Um, so they're much, much smaller. Um, and they also are black and white, but they don't have the stripes. They have spots. Hence the uh, name. Hence the name. <laughs> yeah. um, so the black and white's really a communication um, for predators that, hey, you might not want to be around me. I can, you know, they have chemical warfare, basically. <laughs> right. And um, <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> um, so it's a good communication device for them um, that black and white is not something to mess with. Okay. So now as far as their defense mechanism goes, we were just talking yep. about that. Um, so there's... I don't know if they're myths or they're or not. Um, can you walk away from a skunk and he, if you, as long as you don't startle it, you're okay? Or how, what, should, what should you do if you approach a skunk? I sure. Guess? So one of the things that um, gets skunks in trouble is they have really bad eyesight. Oh. So you can walk right up to them sometimes and they won't even know you're there. Or they do. Um, and they know that they're kind of slow. So they'll, they'll um, take advantage of that chemical weapon, mm. uh, per se. Um, but that, that smell that, that takes a lot of energy to produce. Mm -hmm. So they are not going to use that unless they absolutely have to. What they'll do is they'll do some threatening displays. Um, they sometimes will pound their feet on the ground and thump. Oh. Uh -huh. So it'll be like thump, 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 thump. And the louder and faster it is, the more aggressive they're trying to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're putting a little show on trying to keep you away. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I've walked up to many skunks and been in a very, um, uh, challenging positions and gotten out without having to take a tomato uh, bath. So you can do the tomato thing and that you works? You can. There's, um, so if your dog or someone gets sprayed, there's a bunch of uh, skunk neutralizers out there that mm -hmm. you can purchase and some of them work better than others. You can take the tomato bath. Mm -hmm. um, it's not 100% effective. <laughs> Uh, and that skunk spray lingers for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, essence of skunk um, is actually used in perfumes. Really? Hold, because that's, if you think about it, that smell lasts, lasts a, long for a long time. So time. that ability to last the smell is one of the things they could use for perfumes. Mm -hmm. They want that perfume smell to last. Okay. So trappers will actually extract the scent glands out of skunks and sell that mm -hmm. um, as part of the animal. Hmm. So I noticed, because um, you can smell a skunk on the if the one was oh, yeah. hit or something on the side of the road so is that just something if they get hit they automatically do or? yeah when they um when they end up getting you know usually what happens is with the, at the last second they'll spray mm -hmm. or when they actually get the trauma they'll spray oh, um okay. there are you know the trappers have kind of figured out ways to um dispatch the animal without having them spray obviously if they spray they lose the value of that that um organ right and if it's you know not empty if it's empty it's useless right so um there are ways of you know dispatching animals and having that but most of the time when they get hit by cars they're going to spray and mm. um you know they they can run out of spray so oh. um especially you know if you've ever come across 
um, young baby skunks. Mm -hmm. They'll, uh, because of their size and threat and feeling threatened, they'll spray quite a bit, but they'll actually run out of that um, okay. and you won't be able to spray anymore. How long does it take them to? It, that's a good question. It probably depends on a couple of different things, including, you know, how healthy they are and the mm -hmm. diet and time. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm guessing the, the bigger the animal, the quicker it is okay. to uh, rejuvenate. So how long do they live? So skunks can live several years. Um, unfortunately, they do get uh, predated on by, by animals, despite the smell. Uh, owls are a big one. Oh, really? Yeah, owls and raptors will pick them off. Um, because birds really have no sense of smell. Oh, that helps. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then, um, you know, hungry animals may may uh, still go after them if they're, they're hurting um, coyotes, mm -hmm. bobcats, those kind of things. Okay. And how many children do they have? They will have uh, litters that can range up to f uh, five, oh. um, usually once a year. Once a year. Um, sometimes twice, depending on where you are, north to south gradient, mm -hmm. how long the summers last. Yeah. Um, so they, they do reproduce, um, like most uh, mesopredators, so like raccoons and mm -hmm. possums, they... They aren't um, super productive like rodents, but but uh, they they there's enough of them coming to <laughs> stay around. And currently, it's February and it's in the middle of mating season. Oh, okay. So we're gonna see a lot more skunks on the sides of roads as they go out. Unfortunately, smell a lot more skunks. Yes. Um, this is the one mating season, I guess, in Kentucky. Right, right in November, we have to worry about deer mating season, which is a little bit more uh, worrisome if you hit right. one of those. This one is just might smell a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you will see an increase in the number of skunks and sides of roads right about now, and um, they'll be out walking around a little bit more. Okay. So where do they live? What what kind of habitat do they live in? Sure. So they, they will take advantage of a lot of different um, habitats, as we've mentioned, um, but they will. So they are mostly nocturnal. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll start coming out right about dusk mm -hmm. and then try to head back in at dawn. But um, And they spend their days in dens. Mm -hmm. um, that could be something as simple as a hole in a tree, uh, a tree log that they cover themselves up with leaves and other materials to uh, hopefully not your uh, foundation of your house. Oh. <laughs> um, so they are um, not really great climbers, so they're mm -hmm. going to stay mostly on the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. They can get themselves into trouble uh, if you have beehives. They'll investigate those and try to get at those. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, the other thing they get in trouble for is they'll dig holes in your yard looking for grubs. They're mostly uh, in insect eaters. Yeah, and, I was just going to ask you what mast, they mast, uh, soft mast, um, but a lot of grubs and those kind of things. So they'll actually... Uh, folks that just put sod down or, or have uh, yards that are well taken care of will sometimes get very annoyed because they'll find four or five inch deep holes that are about the size of a baseball where okay. they're dug in and grabbed the grub and went looking. And so you may end up with two or three dozen of them in one spot. Oh, okay. So they can cause some damage that way. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for coming in today. Yeah, we appreciate sure. it. No problem. Thank you for joining us today, and we have a new show schedule for spring 2019. You can listen to us live on WRFL 88.1 FM on Mondays from 11 a.m. to noon. And if you miss the Monday shows, you can listen to our podcasts on our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM. And, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.